Let's start with the fact async and await are nothing more than a syntax sugar, which means they are just a thin wrapper around other language features. Hey YouTube, what's going on? In today's video, we're gonna see how compiler sees async and await in C sharp so that we understand that we should not spray async and await all over our codes without being aware of what's going on under the hood. If you haven't seen the part 1 and you don't know what is the awaitable and awaiter pattern, you might want to check it out. Finally, make sure to subscribe if you want to see more of these videos. So if you're ready, let's dig in. In today's video, we are using sharplab.io, which is a website that we can use to see the compiled version of the code as we write the code. We can see the compiled version at C sharp level, IL or JIT. We can also switch the release or debug configuration. Now let's start with a simple example. Let's write using var ms equals new system dot io dot memory stream and open and close this as you can see there is no using a statement in the compiled code the using a statement has been transformed into a try finally block which means using is just a thin wrapper around try finally the same thing is true about async and await so let's check it out let's remove this and change this to async task and let's import using system dot threading dot tasks now let's add a few lines of code here console dot write line start Let's add another one. Finish. And let's put an await here. Await task dot delay for one second. Now let's see what is the compiled code. As you can see, our method has been transformed into an struct. By the way, this is the release version. In the debug version, it's a class. This struct implements iAsync state machine, which means it has to have one method, move next. And a state machine is a machine with a set of states, and we can transition between those states with some criteria. In this state machine, we have states indicated by an integer. Using the move next method, we transition through these states. The starting state is minus one. After each state, we increment this state field. The finishing state is minus 2. Before we get into the move next method, let's see our method. It's still there, but there is no async and await inside our method. Even there is no sign of our code inside this new method. Inside this new method, we create an instance of the state machine. We create and assign an async task method builder to this state machine. We set the state to minus 1 which is the starting state and we pass the state machine to this builder and we call the start to start the state machine. Finally we return the task from the builder. An async task method builder is very similar to the task completion source that we discussed in the part 1 of this video. It is used to create tasks and we can set the result or set exception or etc on that task. After calling the start on the builder, the start method of the builder calls the move next method on the state machine. And that's the moment our code starts. As we enter the move next method, our state is minus one. The number of states is the number of await keywords in your code plus one. In each state, we have the code before the await keyword until the previous await keyword and the code in front of the await keyword. If there is no other await keywords here, we include everything to the start of the method. So, in the starting state, 
We have this console dot write line start and the await keyword is transformed into the get awaiter method which we discussed extensively in the previous video, the part one of this video. Immediately after we check if the awaiter has already been completed. If it's completed, we just go to get the result of the awaiter and after that we do the rest of the statements. As you can see here, the task that delay has no result. That's why we don't get any result here, it's just returning void. And in the end, we call the setResult method on the async task method builder, which finishes everything. But let's say the task or the awaiter has not been completed already. When this happens, we have to wire up a callback so we can return and continue our code after the completion of the task or the awaiter. And we do that using the async task method builder. We pass the awaiter and the state machine to its await unsafe uncompleted method. If you remember from the part one, we had an uncompleted method which takes a continuation action on any task awaiter. And I told you whenever that continuation action is called, the awaiter finishes its working. Now you should understand what is that continuation that continues our code? That continuation is just calling the move next again. I want to also mention the execution context and the synchronization context will be attached to this code. And as I said previously, this is the topic for the part 3. And I'll only create that part if you support these two videos by liking and subscribing. So let's say the task finishes after one second, by the way it's just a delay, and we return here. The state is no longer minus one, which means we end up here in the else statement. We get the awaiter that we stored previously in a field. We clean up that awaiter and we also clean up the state. We set the state to minus one. This cleanup is what we do after starting each state. We do this to make sure if anything goes wrong and we want to start the state machine again, everything is fresh. So if anything goes wrong, we go to the catch statement, we set exception on the builder, which sets exception on the task, we set the state to minus 2 and we return. But if nothing goes wrong, we can get the result of the previous evader and then we execute the rest of the statements. Now, let's make this a little more complex. Any parameter that we add to our method will become a field in the state machine. So let's use these A and B and C. As you can see, these are now fields. Also, if our tasks have any result, such as this one, task from result, and if we store this, let's say we send A here, okay, and we use X here. Now, this local variable has also been transformed into a field. And that means we have to store x somewhere that we can fetch it after we come back with a callback to the move next method. The other thing to mention is that now we have a variation of task evaders here because we have a task evader which returns a void here and we have a task evader which returns integer. We are also using the evader tool that result. Now for the conclusion. We can say as the number of the parameters, local variables, the variation of the task evaders, and the number of states arise, our state machine becomes bigger and bigger. That's why I said do not spray async and await all over your code without knowing what you're doing. So if you enjoyed this video and learned something new, please do me a favor and hit that like button and if you want to see more of these videos please subscribe to my channel and enable the notification bell so you will be notified whenever the new video arrives until next time adios amigos